Thank you for joining me on this special Listen Up Homebuyer podcast. I'm Victoria Ray Henderson, the host, and I frequently talk with my friends who are NABA members, um, all the people here in this group, about what is happening in the markets where they serve homebuyers. And, you know, we just came up with the idea of saying, hey, let's get together and give people an overview of what conditions are like um, where we are working. So I'll start off with some quick introductions. I'd like to introduce David Kent. He is the president and owner of The Real Buyer's Agent in South Carolina. Hi, David. Hello, hello. Mike Crowley, the owner of Spokane Buyers in Washington State. Hey, Mike. Good morning and afternoon. <laughs> Andy DeFelice, the owner and broker of Exclusive Buyers Realty in Savannah, Georgia. Hi, Andy. Hi. Rich Hardy is the owner and broker of Hardy Realty Group in Chicago, Illinois. Hi, Victoria. Hey. Hey, everybody. And, and then we have Laura Cusimano, the broker of Lugs House Hunters, exclusive buyer agents in New York and Florida. Hi, Laura. Hi, and thank you for having me, Victoria. Absolutely. Uh, I'm the owner and broker of Home Buyer Brokerage in the Washington, D.C. and Baltimore area. And let's just dive into it. Um, I'm going to pick randomly. So, Andy, what's happening in Savannah, Georgia right now? So right now we've got about two months of inventory flow for us. Of course, I think it's pretty much national. Right now. One thing I did notice when I was looking at stats in preparation for this meeting, our days on market is higher than it was this time last year. Last June, it was 32 days on market. Now it's 47 days on market, which means houses are not moving immediately when they hit the market, which is good. They're still moving quickly. We're still seeing multiple offer situations still seeing a lot of all cash offers. Of course, when you're dealing with first time home buyers who are financing, that's a very difficult thing to compete. So it, it's it's still a tough time to be a home buyer right now. You just kind of grow your patience, understand it's not personal. Nobody's nobody's against you. They're just against your offer because there's a better one. And you got to think about what the seller's looking at. And they're going to take the best deal and they're sitting real pretty. Hey, Laura, you want to give a quick update of what's happening on Long Island and New York? And so Long Island's pretty similar. We have very low inventory here. <coughs> um, there are homes that are sitting on the market. I do think that some of them are overpriced. Um, but houses that are priced properly, that are in an area and school district that's highly desirable, we'll get the bidding war on it and probably sell on that first open house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. David Kent, your turn. You're next. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, different markets in our area. We've got downtown, which is historic. Then we've got suburbs and then we've got beach and then we've got resorts. So we've got three resorts in our area. So it's, they're all different. Um, but in general speaking, their inventory is low. Again, we're about two months of inventory. Um, a tri-county wise, we have about 2,200 listings. And prior to COVID, a normal market for us would be 5,500 listings. And I just don't see uh, new construction. There's not enough new construction that's really going to pick up the pace, uh, at, at least right now. Mm. And Mike, Mike Crowley, what's happening in Spokane and the surrounding area? Sounds similar to Savannah. Um, in Spokane, we've, we've probably got about two months supply for existing homes. I think the new construction supply, they've slowed down the building process of that. Um, and they might be about seven months out for new construction now. So we, uh, it's still multiple offers. Uh, we don't have as much cash as we had during, the, during COVID. So cash isn't taking up everything anymore. It's not as prevalent as it was. And instead of 12 offers, it's two, three, or four offers. And maybe homes are getting bid up five, 10, 15,000 instead of 20, 25, or 40,000 dollars. I tell people the crazy buyers are gone. And that <laughs> makes a big difference because competing against a crazy buyer was not a very good way to buy real estate. So mm -hmm. I think the crazy buyers are gone. Interest rates are still a deterrent. And um, I'm not opposed to waiting to the end of the year because most experts think interest rates will be down closer to 6% than 7 by then. Mm -hmm. And five percent, yeah. and they'll be in the five percent next year by most project, most projections. Sadly, we're waiting for a recession to help interest rates. I hate to say that too. Mm -hmm. So, Rich, what do you, what do you, what's happening in Chicago? 
Yeah, I think I would share pretty much the same things that everybody else has, uh, low inventory. Um, but I am seeing some crazy buyers. I just lost an offer to somebody who was willing to do no inspections. Mm -hmm. So we still do have some of that craziness out here. Uh, some cash offers where mortgage people are coming in higher than cash offers and the sellers feel confident that uh, that would be a better route for them. So we're still seeing excuse me, some of that craziness, but uh, it's, um, you know, dealing with some of the same things that you guys are all dealing with, low inventory and, and whatnot. Yeah. And here in the Washington, D.C. and Baltimore area, I mean, I guess it's across the board, low inventory, um, more buyers than houses for sale. And according to Bright MLS data, we have less than half the inventory we did in 2019. And our new listing activity is at more than a two decade low. Now, in our area, what's kind of crazy is houses sell faster than five days. So they're on the market for five days. And if you don't get in, get out, get everything lined up and get your offer in, you've missed out on that house. So it, it's a stressful market for a lot of buyers. Um, and that's that's hard. You know, it's hard for us and it's really hard, especially for the first time home buyers. Good. Victoria, I read something recently that in the state of Maryland, more than half of the buyers at one point were from out of the country recently. Mm -hmm. We have a lot yeah. of a lot of I mean, um, international people because of the nature of of DC. You know, of DC course. has yeah. all, and so yeah, and actually Arlington and uh, um, Alexandria are similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think nationwide it's like two percent, but in the Maryland area, I heard it was over fifty percent for a phase. Mm -hmm. So that's probably a lot of cash there. I so. It is. Yeah. I have some of those cash buyers, but, but yeah. and that, that that's helpful, but uh, yeah. So let's talk strategies. What, what's everybody doing, you know? Wow. A lot so that your buyers don't lose hope. You just keep positive. I was actually speaking to a prospective new agent this morning. And he said, I tend to get really emotional. And I said, you can't, it's your job as the agent to keep your buyers emotions at bay if you can and like I said you can't take this personally and they do and I think the younger first-time home buyers really take it their offers not accepted so you just have to stay positive and let them know they're not alone in this fight one you're in it with them and two every other buyer out there is in it with them and unfortunately you're going to be pitting yourself against those other buyers Mm -hmm. you're, you're making an all cash offer, make it with your proof of funds. That's one thing I've done with my cash buyers that I think has made us a little more successful. And I don't know how it is in y'all's market, but our our agents aren't submitting the proof of funds with an all cash deal. They put, we'll get it to you in two or three days. Well, I send it with the offer. So the seller can see right there. Here's my bank statement. Here's, mm -hmm. I can show you I have those funds. You don't have to wait two or three days for me to prove to you. So that's something that we've had success over other offers when we're dealing with this. Yeah, I mean, I like uh, Andy. Some of my clients cannot, uh, can't pay cash, but they may have a relative that's willing to step on the uh, contract and show cash, let them go ahead and work on a loan, and hopefully they don't need the cash to close. So that's been, that's been, uh, at least something that's helped my clients out. And also if the if they have the ability, my clients have the ability to let the sellers stay in the house for two weeks after, yep. that can make a big difference too. So trying to figure out what the hot buttons are for the exactly. seller, certainly showing cash, I think at the top. Um, and then is there something else that really makes a difference to them? That, you're right. That preliminary phone call to the listing agent, why, which is why I think it's so important if you can in your market to form relationships with your listing agents. We can, we're in small markets. So I know most of the listing agents, I can pick the phone up and, and call and say, okay, besides the price, what does your seller need? Do they want to sell some of the furniture? Do they need an extended you know, occupancy time? What is it we can do that can sweeten our deal above somebody else's? And normally they'll tell you. Yeah, that's something still, I was- Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, I always ask, uh, the listing agent, you know, what else besides price is would would help with the seller, you know, in terms of the terms and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and then just really reaching out, I, uh, making sure that I'm staying in touch with all my listing agent network. 
mm -hmm. uh, making sure that I'm uh, on the pulse in terms of what is coming to market, uh, making sure that we're one of the first people in the door so that we can go ahead and, and evaluate it quickly and decide whether or not we want to move on mm -hmm. with that particular property. So, but um, I just recently had to tell somebody six times that they weren't the winner. Mm. And, um, you know, the first two times Ouch. was tough. Third was still, you know, but after the fourth time, um, we kind of just, uh, we knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. And, um, but uh, the seventh time we had success. So I think you just, stick with it, you just stick with it. And, you know, it, as in anything, um, you know, once we did find the right house, it was truly the right house. So that was kind of a, a neat little thing to happen at the end. It's there. funny. It's funny how that works out, you know, how uh, I had one client, um, 14 offers and 15th was the charm. And, wow. you know, he was looking on Capitol Hill, which is a really popular mm -hmm. part of town. And when he finally found it, you know, he, he wouldn't stop texting me about how excited he was from his rooftop deck, you know, and it was, so it is funny how that, that works out, but yeah, you've got to, you got to look at that long game because, it, and it's hard. Yeah. One of the other things that we can, that we've been doing in our area. So, and I'm not sure if it works for all of you. But with the mortgages, we're actually able to get a commitment up front. So sometimes that actually helps when you're competing against somebody else that may be cash. Yeah. Could you could you flush that out a little bit for people who are listening and who don't know what that means? Tell me about that. So um, instead of just going and getting pre pre-approval with the mortgage process, they actually had the underwriter go through all of their doc documentation and give a commitment letter. I mean, it does. It, it is going to be based on the appraisal. There are some things, but it's it's showing that the buyers are qual one hundred percent qualified to buy the property. So right. it gives you a little bit of an upper upper uh, edge against some of the other people that are either getting a mortgage or maybe if there's somebody else that has cash. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll, I'll mention we're still using the home inspection as leverage with we convince our like in, you talk about 64 offers on a property whoever got that property is not making any home inspection requests because there's 63 people behind them ready mm -hmm. to buy the home mm -hmm. well, I think the same goes for an instance where there's four or five or six offers so once your buyers realize that absent something significant they're not going to get anything on their home inspection. Mm -hmm. So if they offer to pay the first thousand or actually up to $2,000 of anything that comes up on the home inspection, that takes away some of that uncertainty from the seller. And that's been pretty effective in our market still. It's not as important as it was two years ago, but it's still a tool we're using. Okay, so can, so describe that a little bit more because somebody who doesn't understand any of that. So basically what you're saying is, is unless there's something horrible on this home inspection, we're going to buy the house. And if there is something that comes up on the home inspection, we will write the check for the first one or $2,000 to address it, which usually will cover anything on our homes. Usually our home inspections are pretty mild here. We don't have a lot of things that beat up our houses here. So um, that just tells the seller, it's like these people are ready to buy. And if something comes up like a cracked seal on a window or the chimney needs recapped or the furnace needs service, they're going to write the check for all of that. More often than not, they don't write the check. They just say, let's buy the house and we'll do those things when we move in. Mm -hmm. but they have to write the check first, which usually the, I have yet to have a seller write a check over and above my clients because my clients never step up all the way. So it's, we're pretty much waiving the inspection, but we're doing it and we're protecting our rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just want to jump in and say, Mike made a reference to um, 64 offers. And what that was, um, was in the Washington area, I have an investor client and he was buying a property that was in, in distress. I mean, you couldn't live in it. And um and he ultimately decided not to make the offer, but because I had been in contact with the listing agent, they sent me an update. And the update was, we received 64 offers. We're going to get back to you in a couple of days. It's going to take a while to go through this. 64 offers, I've never heard of that many. And so that was what I had, had shared with everybody. It was pretty shocking. Yeah. So we do something similar to what Mike's talking about in Chicago. I don't know if you guys are doing it too, but as is. Mm -hmm. has become kind of so commonplace. Um, and that's really 
you know, um, you know, still inspecting, making sure that you're buying the right home. You're you're still going through your due diligence, but the as is is telling the seller up front that you're you're not going to come back and try and renegotiate the offer, and that you're going to take it as is. And um, you know, sometimes if there's something very serious, then you can go ahead and have that conversation um, with the listing agent and the seller. But uh, ordinarily, it's just meant to be that you're going to move it on. Uh, and take it from there. And then one other thing, Laura mentioned something about the appraisal. We're also um, confirming that we will cover any appraisal gaps. Mm -hmm. So if the appraisal doesn't uh, meet where we are uh, at our sale, at our offer price, that our, our accepted offer price, that we will cover the difference between the appraisal and that offer price and, mm -hmm. and give the seller the confidence of knowing that they can move forward with, with our offer. And, you know, talking about all these strategies makes me realize that um, all of these things that we're talking about are the, are the buyer's choice. And, and, and so when, when you're meeting with buyers, you know, how do you get them up to speed so that they understand what this market is going to be like in the area where they're buying? I think you just I don't have think a real candid conversation. You have to really set the expectation. I tell them it's not as much fun to buy a house as you think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's under promise. It's under promising and over delivering. I'm saying I'm excited. We're going to help you find a house. But if people tell you this is a fun process, it's a tough process. But we're going to do it together. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a team process. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be on their own. But if you tell them it's going to be a blast, and two weeks later you've lost out on three homes, they're going to say he lied to me. He said this was going to be lots of fun. So I don't tell them it's fun. I can try to make it fun, but it's tough. It's work. Yeah, I think it falls under set realistic expectations and, and yeah. you got to explain what's happened. And yeah. I'm dealing with a, a client right now. She's in her early 70s, retired attorney, and we've lost two deals this week. It's like, this is brutal. And I said, OK, but in real life, you've gone through worse than this, right? I mean, you're an attorney. You've lived 70 years. This is not the worst thing that's happened. To you. Yes, it's painful, but there'll be another one. And at the same time, we lost two deals this week. Those two houses weren't on the market last week. So who knows what next week's going to be. We are seeing a little bit more inventory trickling in. So just sit tight. It'll be there. And, and don't feel like it's brutal. It, it is. But it's going to be okay. We'll get there. So what I found is the hardest thing is to navigate the, the group of buyers that you're going up against. Because that's the that mix changes. You know, sometimes you have the, the buyer that's putting in their first offer. So they're maybe a little bit more timid and maybe there's a buyer that's already lost three or four homes. So they're going to be more aggressive. So it's just really kind of a little bit of the luck of the draw of who you're going up against. I mentioned earlier that, you know, we had a cash offer and the seller decided to take a mortgage because those people, you know, cash is generally always king until the mortgage offer was so much higher that the seller decided to take that chance. So, you know, we thought we were very confident going in with cash only to be beat out by somebody who had a mortgage, you know, so it's, you know, it's just that mix and you never know exactly who's going to be stepping in and, and how that's all going to be playing out. Hey, I'm hope you know, one of the things when I'm working with buyers, I, I hope they have the ability to stay where they are in the long, you know, if they're in an apartment, can they renew the lease? Because that gives them the ability to right. wait out to find the right property at the right price in the right condition. Because if not, the pressure gets on and you really have to start figuring out what do you have to take away from what you normally would have in an offer to make it work. And that becomes more pressure for the buyer. And it's, it's generally not good. So if we've got somebody that's, that can stay in an apartment or stay in a rental place and they don't have to move right away, then I think life becomes a lot easier for one. Well, I want to start clearing out your guest room and getting ready to move them into your house till you find them <laughs> somewhere, right, Nick? <laughs> Absolutely. Not, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I want to ask everybody about um, uh, letters to the sellers. Um, go around and tell me. I see Mike shaking his head. Mike, you're going to be first up. How do you feel and what's the rule where you are in Washington State about writing a letter to the seller and telling them how much you love their house? I think they can do just as much harm as good. 
And I actually teach a fair housing class where we really talk about why that's a no-no. It's not a risk to a buyer. I know some realtors say to their buyer, oh, that might be a violation of fair housing to write a letter. That's not being honest with your buyer. It's a risk to a seller to look at a fair housing letter or a, a love letter is what we like to call them. So I have not had a client write one in a long time. I had one that verbally begged to a seller once when we were there at her house looking at it. And she ended up getting the offer accepted and walked away after she begged for the off her offer to be taken. Mm. So I've seen some letters where the sellers are a little offended because sometimes they're presumptuous, you know, making a comment. It's like, looks like you've raised a lovely family in that house. They might be going through an awful divorce and can't wait to get out of that house and to be out of it. So they can be presumptuous and insulting. And uh, I know people sometimes say they work because they happen to write when they may have happened to have also written the best offer. So you can simultaneously be right. I think the letter worked, we got the offer, but sometimes it might've been the best offer as well. As a rule of thumb, I don't think sellers really like them. They should never read them, even though in our state, it's required that you, you present everything to the seller, you have to. Um, that's at least how our legal counsel interprets it. I don't know if I agree with that or not, because I don't know if a love letter really is part of a purchase and sale agreement. So mm -hmm. anyway, they're pretty much faded away here. People aren't doing them so much. Um, and I think that's realtors educating their clients. So. Mm -hmm. Had two this year and we won on both. The, the buyers wanted to write them. But funny story with one, the guy, my buyer, works for a virtual reality marketing company. He said three words to an AI program in it read. And it <laughs> sounded like, I mean, it was so, when they sent it to me, it was beautifully, I didn't know that's what had happened. And I called him and I said, this made me cry. And he said, AI did it. And I'm like, oh, that's really kind of sad. Oh no. But oh yeah, but they, we got the house. And then one I just closed last week for a little couple I've been working with for three years, they wrote one similar story. They have a new baby. You could see the sellers had a new baby and they tugged at those heartstrings. We did not win that offer first go around, but we put a backup offer in and first offer fell apart and we got it in backup situation. I don't encourage it, but if my buyer wants to do it, I tell them the same thing. It can blow up in your face. I can't promise it'll make a difference. Some sellers care. Some sellers really don't care. But if you yeah. want to do it, I'll, I'll put it in front of them. And we won both times. Well, one was the computer. The computer won, <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> I'm seeing where listing agents are putting in agent remarks, no love letters. No, not really? They, no. they just write from the very beginning. Please do not uh, put any uh, but, love letters out there with as part of your offer. But in our you state, if they get one, they still have to present it in our state, supposedly, even if they write that in there. Yeah. Wow. We're getting that with escalation clauses, too. They're putting that in the agent remarks. Don't, no escalation clauses. Don't want to oh. fool with it. We're not going to do that kind of math. Just don't bother. Same, yeah. Same thing. Same thing, New time. York. We're not really doing the, le the letters or the escalation clauses. Like the agents just don't want to hear it. They want a real offer and that's it. I, I like I like the escalation clause because it's a way for me to protect my buyers from spending too much. Um, and so we're still using them and they're effective and, and we've had offers accepted. In fact, the last two because, and, and they had escalation clauses. I agree. I, I've used them. I find them really effective yeah. too, but yeah, I'm still using them. Yeah. But we're yeah, now when we're escalating, them. we're escalating at a far higher level than we used to. When I first started using it, uh, probably six, seven years ago, we would maybe escalate a thousand dollars over. Now we're escalating 4,500 or 5,000 wow. over mm -hmm. just to make sure that um, we're giving the seller that kind of incentive to say, you know, for a thousand dollars, a lot of sellers, you know, they they might look at both offers a little bit more closely. But if they can make five thousand, they're going to give a little bit more consideration to that escalation clause. Is mm -hmm. what I found significant. Yeah, I also I also look up um, the listing agents. I know many many listing agents in the area, but. I look them up and I see what they've sold recently and I check the pattern of behavior, you know? So for example, one that I just submitted today, I did that as a strategy. And then I looked at what, what their pattern is, like how much 
are people escalating above or what what's going on? And you can gleam some information from that. And as much as I can, then I use that as well, kind of put that in my toolbox as, as another strategy, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. David, what are they doing in South Carolina? Do you use escalation clauses? Um, I, I don't. Um, and I haven't seen too many with escalation clauses. Um, and we also see like, you know, listing agents will say no love letters. Um, so they must have been counseled by their broker in charge or somebody to say that. So I'm seeing that pretty consistent. Uh, so it's really just put your best offer out there and and hope you are you make it. If not, you got to try the next one. No, I was just saying we were able to negotiate with an option where basically we said to the seller, we'll buy your house. Here's our purchase and sale agreement. And we're giving you an option, thousand bucks. It was a $200,000 townhouse. Whether we perform or not, you get to keep this thousand dollars. And oh. even if we perform, we don't get it as a credit. You put it in your pocket. It's your money. It doesn't go into escrow. It was paid to her immediately. It was, a, it was an estate sale probate situation. So it had to be cleaned out. We had to do some smoke remediation once we got it. And once she was able to move out, we were under contract immediately. It never hit the hill. Mm. So if there's an area that you want to look at, that's what I'm saying. If you know agents that work that area, reach out and see if they know of anything coming up. You never know. Great idea. And Mike Crowley, baby market. Mike Crowley, you were talking about, uh, or I'm sorry, maybe Andy, it was you mentioning about coming soon, no longer being legal where you are. Talk a little bit about that, please. Y'all had the same thing, Mike? Yeah, actually, NAR actually took it up shortly after we did. We were one of the first in the country about four years ago, but NAR does have their clear cooperation policy, which pretty much requires, should have nipped coming soon in the butt for everybody. It's just a matter of who's enforcing it and where. So, but yeah, we have, we, we did it years ago. And with, talk with, about, talk about why that matters. Do you want to go ahead, Andy? It doesn't matter. Go ahead. Okay. So the coming, the idea of coming soon is it's supposed to be exposed to the overall market. It should not be exposed to the market until it's an active listing and coming soon was sort of circumventing that and what was happening, at least in our market, where a lot of the larger real estate firms they would share their coming soons with their other agents within their office, but they weren't being shared with the rest of the real estate population in town. Mm -hmm. And it was an unfair advantage. And basically, if the house is listed, it needs to be exposed to everybody. It shouldn't be exposed to the general public at all when it's in a coming soon situation. But if you work in one of the larger brokerages and you hear about a coming soon and you call your client and say, I just heard about this, you just exposed it to the general public. So they shut it down completely. So there is no, we don't have this coming soon, which is wonderful because they're hard, they're awful. Mm -hmm. um, now, if it's active, it's active and everybody knows about it. In our market was similar. We had one particular office that would put the sign in the yard on Wednesday, mm -hmm. let it sit there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And if you called the listing agent, some reason, if you were a buyer, you were able to get in. But if you called your realtor, and they'd call that agent, that agent would say it's not coming on the market till Monday or it's not available to show yet. So we we wrestled with this for about two months or for about two years, our steering committee did, and they put together the policy, which pretty much prohibited entirely. But it's it reflects poorly on us because if it's your client calls you up and says, I can't show you that house, and then they drive by and somebody else is looking at it, and then they buy it. And when it comes on the market at Tuesday, it comes on uh, listed pending or listed while pending or something like that. Okay. So it doesn't happen here. People still try to do it a little bit, but the penalties here are the thousands of dollars if you okay. do it and you get caught. Okay. So be okay. careful. So I've got a question for each of you. Um, and this is, is dual agency allowed in your state? Raise your hand if dual agency is allowed. Okay. Uh, who wants to take that on? Um, because, well, I, I will just say in the Washington, D.C. area, it's Maryland, Virginia, and D.C. Virginia and D.C. allow dual agency. Maryland allows designated agency, which is a form of dual agency. And what I have been seeing in Maryland are a lot of uh, in in our MLS system um, where it looks like there is actually dual agency happening. So, Somebody tackle and explain what is dual agency. 
um, dual agency is, well, I'll give an example. So a listing agent is having an open house and a buyer that does not have an agent goes in and the listing agent actually represents the seller um, is going to say, um, we, we're allowed to do a dual agency in our state. We have a, an agency disclosure form. They go through it. And if the buyer agrees, then technically the listing agent is representing both the seller and the buyer in the transaction. Um, which I always said, if you compared that to, if you went to a lawyer and you're getting a divorce, would you want the same attorney to repre to be representing both of you? How do you do that? Yeah, um, it'd be disbarred. <laughs> we have the um, the des designated dual agency. We have the designated agent um, as well in our state. So that is the option, um, but it's really not that much better because mm -hmm. basically it's saying, I'm the listing agent. I'm going to keep representing my my seller, um, and I'm going to give you another agent from within my company, who's probably their friend or something, and they're going to be representing you, Mr. Buyer, in this transaction. So that's what we have. Everybody, jump in, comment, because I know you're dying to. <laughs> It's why we oh, do well, what we do. <laughs> well said, well put. I mean, it right. just yeah. it makes no sense at all uh, right. to have to be represented by the same person or the same company if you have a choice. Yeah. And you have a choice. So. You can't serve two masters. So who are you? Yeah. If you're working for the buyer and you're working for the seller, you're really working for your commission because that's the only reward in the whole situation. Yeah. How can you possibly do that correctly? And, and with any kind of integrity, in my opinion. And I think Laura's example of the attorneys, I think that always hits home with, with most buyers. Um, but it comes down to more things than just price. Um, there's closing uh, details, there's inspection details, there's terms, there's appraisals, there's all sorts of different things that that, that one agent is going to need to navigate through. So um, as you get into the thick of it, I think that's where the difficulty becomes um, you know, making sure that both sides are getting that balanced um, sense of representation. Yeah. Mike, you want to jump in? Um, you know, for people that don't follow real estate, the incentive for a listing agent to do that is because ideally they can make twice as much money by keeping you, <clears throat> excuse me, twice as much money by keeping you from being properly represented. Mm -hmm. And then you could argue on their behalf, they've earned it. If they keep the buyer from being properly represented, and the seller has an unrepresented buyer, you mm -hmm. know, that's the problem is, is you're not being represented. The agent's happy because they're making twice as much. The seller's happy because they don't have a buyer that's being properly represented. And, and they should want a buyer that's properly represented because I think a real estate transaction goes much better together with two competent real estate agents, mm -hmm. much better than with one. But sometimes they're thinking about money and they're not thinking about a smooth transaction. They're not worried about everybody being happy. Yeah. So. I, I, right. I would like to share with you guys um, real quick, um, according to the Northern Virginia Realtor Association, I'll just read this first line, uh, dual agency, the agent will be unable to advise either seller or buyer as to the terms, offers, or counter offers, except, however, that the dual agent may have already provided such advice to the seller before representing the buyer. They can advise on the suitability of the property, its condition, other than to make disclosures, uh, as required by law and cannot advise either party as to repairs of the property or, uh, and it goes, just goes on and on. It's like, why are you there? <laughs> yeah, to get paid. Right. Get paid. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like there are some buyers out there now that are saying, okay, I, you know, I have access to the MLS. I have access to Zillow. I see what's coming soon. And they want to, they want to get the upper edge. They don't want to be competing against the other buyers in the, in the field. And they do want to go directly to the listing agent because they know there is that, I'm going to say carrot for the listing agent to get both sides of the commission. So it, it is, 
you know, they, they may not know what they're actually buying because obviously we as exclusive buyer agents, we, we bring out the pros and cons of the property and stuff like that, that they may be missing, but they're so desperate to get mm -hmm. the house that they're just taking the chance. Yeah. And I sometimes think it, it can go well. It's possible to go well, but problems do come up. And that's those stories you hear about. It's like, I thought I would do this. I thought I'd go to the listing agent. And I think they messed with me the whole time. And then they complain about that real estate transaction the rest of their life. Yeah. So. Da David and I were right. talking the other day on the phone about this. And I, my prediction is that if people are doing that in this market, we're going to see a wave of people who are saying, oh my God, why, why did I compromise my representation when I was making the biggest financial decision that I am going to make, right? Absolutely. It's just not... It's just not worth it, you know. I write for a local magazine here, and and I just wrote an article about uh, um, how how to survive a seller's market. And you know, I finished by just saying it's a marathon, mm -hmm. and you're running this marathon. And really, the marathon starts between mile twenty and twenty six for a lot of people <laughs> because that's where it really gets tough. And so I just say, you know what, you're you're in between mile twenty and twenty six, and uh, we'll get you there. But uh, you just got to know that you got to dig, uh, dig deep and, and, and push through. We're forming a real relationship and we get as excited and as disappointed as they do. Mm -hmm. And I think they start to realize that the longer we work together, we're in this together. We're not just right. trying to sell you a house. We're trying to help you make an informed decision and really set yourself on a path that you need to be on. It's why we do what we do. I, I think that's the most special part about being a buyer agent or working with buyers is knowing that you're putting your buyer on a trajectory and that you're just kind of like you're creating um, the path that they will take um, through this this major purchase. And I think uh, when you hand them the keys, I think that's a really great feeling. So. Rich Hardy, Andy DeFelice, Laura Cusimano, Mike Crowley, and David Kent. We are members of the National Association of Exclusive Buyer Agents. We came together today to talk about market conditions in June 2023. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. It has been so much fun. Thanks, Thanks Victoria. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take Bye. care. Bye.